Well, hello everyone and welcome and thank you for joining us for our second monthly U.S. Cattle Trace Wednesday webinar. My name is Callahan Grund and I serve as the Executive Director for U.S. Cattle Trace. U.S. Cattle Trace are, is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to develop and manage a nationally significant animal disease traceability system for cattle that enter our food supply chain. Through this webinar, we at U.S. Cattle Trace hope that this webinar and subsequent ex educational opportunities will help provide our members and partners with the information they need to make important decisions related to their operations on a variety of topics. Today, we're glad to welcome James Mitchell to, the uh, to speak on the economics, excuse me, of cattle traceability. James is an assistant professor in the Department of An Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness at the University of Arkansas, an extension livestock economist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. James has a BS and MS degrees from Oklahoma State University and a PhD in agricultural economics from Kansas State University. Mitchell leads integrated extension and research programs that address issues that span the livestock and meat supply chain. His extension programming primarily focuses on livestock marketing and risk management. Mitchell's recent research is focused on biosecurity and foreign animal diseases, cattle traceability and identification, price discovery in fed cattle markets, and beef and livestock trade. He also has an appreciation for interdisciplinary projects and regularly collaborates with animal science and forage specialists. As you can see, James's recent research is very timely with all the topics in the beef cattle industry. So we're excited to have James on today. Following the end of his presentation, we'll have a 10 minute question and answer session. If you have any questions you'd like answered throughout the session, please feel free to put those questions in the chat or question and answer box found at the bottom of your screen or, and we'll be able to answer those at the, that time period following his presentation. We're also recording today's presentation and we'll be posting it online following the completion for those who are unable to join. James, I'll kick it over to you now to start your presentation off. Welcome. We're glad to have you. I see that OSU in the background. We'll have to get you a K-State one here soon, too. All right. So uh, thanks for the kind introduction, uh, Callahan. I, I appreciate um, Cattle Trace inviting me to talk today. I'm always nice interacting with some fellow uh, K-State alums. So I, I am uh, at the University of Arkansas, um, affiliated with the University of Arkansas, so um, independent of cattle trace, but, but what I'm going to be talking about today is the, the economics of, of cattle traceability and some opportunities for, for value added. Um, you know, there's a lot of people working on traceability from, you know, every angle you can think of, right? So, you know, there's epidemiology, there's vet med, there's logistics, there's animal science, there's, you know, engineering involved. There's all these different aspects of traceability. And, and I'm just talking about one aspect of that, and that's um, the economics of traceability. Um, and, you know, traceability is such, a, such an evolving, uh, you know, topic to, to work on. Um, nothing I'm, I'm really going to be sharing today is really a definitive answer on anything. What I'm really more wanting to, to do today is, is um, kind of think through the, you know, the lens of economics to, to look at this problem of, of cattle traceability. So I am, I'm an economist. Um, I, I probably flatter myself in thinking that I can explain um, anything with, with economics, but that's what I'm gonna try and do today. So just a, a quick overview here. I'm gonna start pretty big. So introduce some, you know, some economic concepts of traceability. So real broad, we're gonna kind of move into more, you know, disease traceability, which is really the focus here. And then we're gonna kind of finish off with a specific farm topic um, that I've been been working on for some time, and then we'll finish up there with with questions like like Callahan said. So uh, I think the the probably the first step here is to recognize that you know traceability in itself really isn't the end goal for us. It's it's realizing that you know traceability is is a tool that we're using to accomplish an objective or, or solve a problem and. In economics, the problem that we that we say that traceability is trying to solve is is a problem called asymmetric information. And really, what this is referring to is just a scenario where one party to a transaction or one group of people has information, the other group doesn't, and traceability is facilitating the transfer of that information. Right. So, for beef cattle, for example, if we're talking disease traceability, 
you know, those cattle have been places, they've interacted with people, they've interacted with other populations of livestock. That information is a no to the groups that need it to, you know, quickly, effectively get that disease under control and eradicate it. So traceability is solving that information problem by having the right information that those groups like, you know, USDA needs to quickly respond to that type of event. Another one of those types of examples for cattle would be, um, you know, product differentiation and what we call credence attributes. So attributes that um, we can't readily observe by looking at something, right? So that's not information I have. So traceability is giving me that information, right? So, you know, there's probably some people that are very, very skilled at this, but for me, for example, I can't look at a group of cattle and say, oh, those are back 45 cattle. I can't do that unless, you know, they've got a, a, a piece of identification that probably associates them with a specific preconditioning program, right? So that, that ear tag might be affiliated with the preconditioned program, and that's telling me that those animals are, are preconditioned with some program, right? So that's an attribute that without that, that identification tag on the ear, I wouldn't be able to know that by looking at them. So recognizing that traceability is just a tool or something that we're using to solve a bigger problem. And, and for cattle, those two problems are really either associated with things like disease traceability or things like, like livestock marketing and communicating things like origin or, or preconditioned programs, stuff like that. So we've identified these, these two areas, disease traceability and kind of marketing of these credence attributes. Um, you know, traceability for, for an industry like the beef sector is really gonna be a coordinated effort um, through that supply chain. So a natural question would be, okay, do we agree on that? Um, so just some research that I've, I've worked on in the past um, at K-State was kind of asking these types of questions. So I'm asking our cow-calf producers in our feedlots you know, if we're going to design a nationally significant traceability program, what things do you think are important? And two of those things that we asked for is managing disease crucial for a national traceability system and is enhancing marketability of our, of our, of our cattle and of our products important to that type of system as well. And in general, between these two groups of people, you know, 40% of cow calf producers think that disease management is very important. 33% of feedlots think it's very important move over to the enhanced marketability side, 35% of cow-calf producers think it's very important. 33% of feedlots think that enhancing marketability is very important. So in general, the conclusion that I would take from this table is that, yeah, um, with regards to these two aspects of traceability, there seems to be an overall level of agreement between these two very, very important sectors within our, our beef supply chain. And so we've got you know, traceability for disease, potentially some, some opportunities for, for value added um, and recognizing, okay, these are our two objectives that we've identified as being important for traceability, but okay, now let's think about how do we get there and importantly recognizing that there's really no one type fits all traceability program, right? So what works for Canada or, or for Australia isn't gonna work in the US. Um, and so there's, there's really, it's really tailored to the specific problem that we're talking about. And so there's some research that suggests that what the traceability system should look like is very, very closely related to the information problem that we're trying to solve. So for this example, and for this talk, disease traceability, that's gonna very, very closely explain what traceability should probably look like in this example. So kind of the, the two questions that I want to specifically go through is okay, Given we're talking about disease traceability, what does economics tell us about what participation should be or what it might look like? And then, okay, what might economics say about how we could potentially improve participation, right? So the, the word that gets used a lot is getting a, a nationally significant traceability system. So how might we do that? And what does economics have to say about those two questions? So, Disease traceability, obviously, um, for it to work, you need sufficient participation. So we need a certain number of farms to be participating and we need to be able to trace, you know, X percent of the cow herd to effectively have disease traceability. I don't have those specific numbers. That's very much a, an epidemiology type question. But the idea is, you know, traceability isn't nationally significant if only 5% of, of our cow herd is traceable 
through that system, right? And so what's determining participation is really the benefits and costs, both realized and expected that are associated with these traceability systems. What the big problem here is, is that the, the public benefit, the, the benefit that all of us enjoy from traceability is much bigger than the private benefit for those that are actually adopting these systems. And, and really what that ends up saying is that, you know, if the public benefit from traceability is larger than the, the private benefit from adopting, then potentially we're going to see a level of traceability that may be less than what we'd like to see. So specifically, what do I mean by that? So the public benefits of disease traceability. Every single one of us benefits from food safety. So if we're talking about a zoonic disease, for example, the whole, the whole country, all single one of us, all of our citizens, we all, everyone here enjoys and benefits from food safety. That's a very, very large benefit, right? That's reduced hospital stays, that's reduced deaths. Having a safe food supply is something that we all appreciate. And the benefit from that becomes even more significant when the threat of a food safety event becomes even, even higher, right? On the cattle industry side, the entire industry benefits from disease-free status. The whole industry benefits from increased consumer confidence from, from higher food safety, right? Those are all public benefits that we all enjoy. On the private side, if we're talking about disease traceability, about the people that are actually supplying it, right? So everyone benefits from food safety, but not everyone contributes to supplying that, that thing that we all enjoy, right? Not everyone's contributing to producing a, a safe food supply, right? That's our farmers, that's our, our, our ag supply chains that are doing that. And so from the private perspective, the people that are actually on the ground adopting traceability, utilizing these things to, to ensure food safety, what are the benefits to those individuals? Of course, there's you know, disease damage mitigation during an outbreak. So worst case scenario, an outbreak happens. If that producer has traceability, you know, it'd be more quickly be able to identify which animals are exposed, which animals are at risk, which animals aren't at risk. Um, there's general on-farm on management benefits for, for operations utilizing traceability, right? So our, our large farms, very, very hard to keep track of all that information on our herd um, in our memory or on paper. So for our larger operations, there's probably just some overall farm management benefits um, to those that are doing and using traceability. There's also the idea of business continuity. So part of you know, the, the secure beef supply chain as an example. So traceability might allow these operations to continue to business as usual if a disease didn't happen, right? So if you can quickly identify that, you know, your herd wasn't exposed, your herd's not at risk, you can more quickly resume business as usual activities. And then the last one that I wanna talk about is the potential for market premiums for those that are in traceability. But the big thing here that I want you to realize is there are really, really, really big benefits to the public from having a, a safe food supply and a disease-free uh, US cow herd. Those benefits are clearly a lot larger and a lot more people benefit from them than our people, our producers that are actually adopting these traceability systems. Because of that, all things equal, everything else constant, nothing else changing, you might expect that participation in this type of traceability system, disease traceability, could be potentially lower than, than maybe what might be ideal. That's everything else unchanged. So if that's what we might expect to see, um, the next question is, well, okay, so if that's what economics says, that, you know, we've got this huge public benefit from food safety, not so much a large benefit for those actually doing it and using traceability, um, what can we do instead to get us to a, a higher level of, of participation in disease traceability? Option one is, is government policy, so mandates, certainly not ideal. Mandates for traceability would only really work under very, very specific circumstances to address a, a clear market failure. Um, the research that I review would suggest that that's not really appropriate in this setting for, for cattle traceability. Um, there's some other research that suggests that, um, you know, simply just having or knowing that there's a potential to have a traceability mandate and cost subsidies associated with adopting traceability, those might in themselves be enough to get us higher participation. And I think that's 
some of what we're actually seeing, right? So cattle trace is an example of this. Other industry-driven traceability systems are an example of this, right? There's this prospect or threat that we might actually have to have mandated traceability. So as an example, that's a motivating factor for the industry to develop their own initiatives to get traceability, right? And then there's this idea of, of cost subsidy. So that's something that's already been done, right? So for example, um, I'll use sheep as an example, the scrapey eradication program, uh, USDA was, I think, providing those tags to be in that program. That's an example of sharing the costs associated with, with participating in a traceability system. I'm sure there's others on, on the call that could probably correct me and, and would certainly know more about that specific example, but just realizing that that's something that we've already done in other examples related to disease traceability. So that's part one of this of what we can do. Uh, part two is let's just design programs and policies that um, are attractive to our, our operations. Our operations want to participate th in this. So what do we do? We either need to increase the benefits from participating in traceability, decrease the costs from participating in traceability, and then create traceability systems that are attractive that producers want to participate in without, of course, sacrificing the usefulness of those programs at doing what we want them to do, which is effectively allow us to trace disease and eradicate disease, right? Um, one of those benefits that, that I've worked on and am, and am thinking through is the idea that, you know, there might be market incentives to, to participate in traceability. Um, and there's a lot around this. I'm not going to cover all of it, but just kind of the area that I've, I've worked on. So we can think through um, cattle traceability as, as an attribute, right? So much like a VAC 45 claim, traceability is an attribute of, of cattle, right? Those cattle are black, those cattle weigh 500 pounds, those cattle are preconditioned, those cattle are enrolled in a traceability system. Those are all attributes associated with those animals. Um, and those attributes are sources of product differentiation. The question that we had was, okay, well, if that's the case, is there a premium for producers to participate in traceability? What is that premium? And is it even feasible for our downstream firms like our feedlots and our backgrounders to even offer a premium for traceability cattle? That's what I asked and, and that's what some of the research we've been working on is asking. And so that's kind of what we've been working on. So a broad example here from a, from a cow-calf perspective, we asked, you know, what would it cost you to participate in a traceability program that utilizes, you know, radio frequency identification? Um, please choose the, the range that, that best reflects your, your perception. So 20% of, of cow-calf producers, 21% rounding up said that, you know, participating in a traceability program that involved RFID would cost more than $16 per head. 10% um, said that participating in a traceability system that involves RFID would cost between $13 and $16 per head. Only 3.6% of the people that we surveyed said that participating in a, in a traceability system with RFID um, would cost less than a dollar per head. Of course, this is phrased very broad um, on purpose, but this is kind of a distribution of, you know, what would it cost our cow-calf producers to, to enroll and, and, and use and participate in, in a system like this? Okay, that's what it would cost a cow-calf producer. So then we asked, okay, well, let's ask feedlots, how much would they be willing to pay to, to procure cattle that, that were participating in a traceability system that utilized RFID? And you know, feedlots, 45%, they'd be willing to pay less than a dollar per head to receive cattle um, that were participating in, in a, a traceability system with RFID. 35% said they'd be willing to pay between one and four dollars per head. 13% between five and eight and only 0.7%. So 1% said they'd be willing to pay more than $16 per head. So as a preview of what we're going to talk about, we've got 21% of cow-calf producers that say um, it's going to cost me more than $16 per head to participate in this type of system. And we've got feedlots with only 1% saying that they'd be willing to pay $16 per head 
uh, to participate in a traceability system with RFID. So there's a disparity between what cow-calf producers perceive it would cost and what feedlots say they might be willing to pay, right? So there's opportunities there for what? Things like a cost share policy where, you know, the, the tag cost is subsidized and maybe a producer only pays half of that, right? That's kind of what this is hinting at is there's potential for those types of policies. Um, so kind of an experiment that we did was we, we set up some experiments where we said, we asked cow-calf producers, you know, given traceability system A, given traceability system B, given premiums, costs, and various other attributes, which system would you choose to participate in? Asked feedlots the same reverse question where given cattle that are in traceability system A, given cattle that are in traceability system B, which system would you choose to procure cattle from? That's generally what we we're asking. And kind of the, the estimate that we were trying to, to tease out was the, the premium that cow-calf producers would need to adopt it and what feedlots would be willing to pay to procure cattle with that type of system. So baseline, what we've got is we've got 44% of cow-calf producers would be willing to participate in a, a, a traceability system with RFID. 39% of feedlots said they'd be willing to procure cattle that are enrolled in a system with RFID. Um, 47 or 48 percent of feedlots would be willing to procure cattle that just have, you know, a traceability system with visual, you know, visual plastic ear tags. 36 percent of cow calf producers said they'd be willing to to do this, and then um, 20 percent of cow calf producers said they wouldn't want to do any form of traceability. So no traceability with no identification at all. 13 percent of feedlots said the same thing. So. What we want to do is we want to see what type of premium for cattle with RFID would it need to get these two groups of people to switch to a traceability system with RFID. That's what we're after here. So if we've got producers that are currently, you know, participating in some sort of traceability that just has plastic ear tags, what type of premium would those people need to switch to an RFID system? That's what we're after. And that's the question that I've asked here. So this graph that we've got here, so cow-calf operations are in blue, feedlots are in red. The y-axis, the vertical line here, this is the dollar per head premium for feeder cattle that are in an RFID system. The x-axis, the horizontal part here, is the percent of producers that would be willing to participate in that traceability system given a certain premium. So you can kind of think of this as a supply and demand graph, right? So if we increase the premium for RFID, more cow-calf producers are going to want to participate in that. If we increase the dollar per head premium that feedlots would have to pay to procure cattle with RFID, as expected, you would think less and less feedlots would want to participate in a system that involves them paying a, a higher premium. And this black dot is the intersection between cow-calf operations and feedlot operations. And so what we find is at a $4.08 per head premium, 42% of cow-calf operations and 42% of feedlots would be willing to participate in a, a hypothetical traceability system with a, a $4.08 per head premium for those cattle that are in that type of system. So again, as I said, let's see what we can do to shift these groups of people to get us to a place of, of higher participation. So part one of this is, okay, let's consider two different types of traceability programs. Let's consider a program that's got RFID technology that's managed purely by the government. So that's on the left-hand side. Okay, and let's consider a different traceability system with RFID that's managed between the government and there's a, an industry private partnership there, right? So um, what's the difference between those two systems? Um, obviously, um, something that's probably no surprise is that our producers have a very, very, very strong preference for traceability systems that are managed privately by industry. Um, and so that's what this is actually really showing us, right? So relative to the graph on the left, which is a system managed by the government, we've effectively shifted the red line and the blue line to the right. And so you get a 
higher level of participation by cow calf producers and feedlots for every premium that's available. So this graph is showing us that for every premium that would be associated with this types of traceability system, we've got a higher number of feedlots and a higher number of cow calf producers that would be willing to participate in these true systems. Again, that's not a surprising result, but what this does is it has us, it actually quantifies with a dollar number what that preference is, and it's pretty high. Uh, producers would be willing to pay a higher premium to participate in something that had private industry involvement. Um, let's see. Part two of this is, okay, so I talked earlier about how there's a big gap between what cow-calf producers think it's going to cost and what feedlots would be willing to offer. So let's consider a government policy where uh, USDA, for example, might share some of the, the tagging cost with our producers, right? So let's assume this blue line is assuming that cow-calf operations are paying the, the full tagging cost associated with participating in a traceability system with RFID. This red line is saying, um, what if cow-calf producers only have to pay 50% of the cost associated with, with tagging and, and participating in traceability with RFID? And then this green line, the far right line, is our cow-calf level of participation if there was a policy such that the tag cost was 100% subsidized, they don't have to pay anything for the actual RFID tag itself. What does that do to participation? And again, as you see, if you decrease the cost of, of participating or, or tagging your animals, you get higher levels of participation. So you get higher participation through a, a cost share policy and feedlots have to pay a smaller premium and we get higher overall participation. So this black dot is the intersection between our feedlots in our cow calf operations under a scenario where that cost of tagging is 100% subsidized, the physical cost of the tag, I should say. And what we get is that we get 50% of, of both groups participating at a $1.92 per head premium. So a very higher, much higher level of participation relative to that first graph that I showed you where we only had 42%. So that's a big gain. Um, and that's through a, a policy that would cover the, the tag cost. Of course, that policy isn't free. Someone has to pay for it. So that gets beyond what we're working on here, but there's obviously uh, next steps involved. So the, the, the take home from this is, so we've kind of, we've talked through the economics of traceability, right? We've said that, you know, for disease traceability, all things equal, you know, we might not have participation where we want it. What are some things that we could change? One specific thing that we just looked at was changing is what if there's potential for, for value added where producers could garner a premium for their calves if they were participating in traceability with RFID. These graphs that we showed you said that yes, there is hypothetically evidence that yeah, feedlots would be willing to pay premiums. Um, and cow-calf producers would accept that premium and, and more and more of them would participate. Um, there's a strong preference for a system that has industry involvement. And then kind of the final piece here, and this is something that um, I've got a question for all of you all, something that I don't have answers to, but it's a question that I'm really, really thinking about a lot is, um, okay, so you're probably asking, okay, great, there's some evidence of this premium that might exist for, for calves that are in traceability with RFID. Uh, great, uh, where is that premium and how do I get it? Um, that's kind of the obvious big question that's still unanswered. That's the question that I've got myself. I'm not sure if I've got, got answers to it. Um, you know, anecdotally, one thing I've heard is, you know, there's some people that have these precondition programs and, and part of those programs that they've been moving towards is, is using RFID technology as a, as a longer list of precondition, um, of a bigger precondition program. So just including RFID into an existing program. And, you know, potentially that, that increases the value of those animals. That's anecdotally one thing that I've heard um, from some examples, but that's obviously the, the big question left. Um, that's, that's kind of where we're, where we're thinking currently. And, um, and that's really what I've got. So 
Um, Callahan, Kyler, if we want to go ahead and, and, and pause here, we can start um, doing some, some discussion and, and answering some questions. James, thank you. That was great. Yeah, reminder, guys, at the bottom of your screen there, you should be able to see it now. Uh, that Q&A in that chat box. Uh, feel free to put any of the questions that you have for James on here. Um, he's got a wealth of knowledge in this area. And so feel free to ask a question there, or if you've got one for us as it relates to us cattle trace, maybe we can tag team that one as well. So I'm going to put in a few uh, comments that came into the chat box during this. And this is from uh, our good friend, Andrew Moxie over in Scotland. He said, traceability is used in Scotland to confirm their protected geographical status of Scotch beef which yields a market premium within their, uh, their traceability system over there. And then the switch from mandatory non-RFID tagging of sheep to mandatory RFID tagging was offered by early adopters subsidizing those tags. So similar to what James talked about there, they saw some positive benefits from that over there in Scotland for more of an international perspective. Yeah, I guess to the, the Scotland piece there, um, it was the premium for beef and, and obviously that gets transmitted down to the farm. So that's just a different example of that premium needs to come from somewhere. Um, is it consumer demand? Is it our processors? Or is it our feedlots? Ideally, that value transmits to the system and creates an incentive to do this. Um, so that's just another example of it's got to come from somewhere. In this example, it's coming from farther down the supply chain. Perfect. Good comment. I'm, I'm really glad that they pointed that out. I did not know that. Here's another question that came in here, James. How would you assess the impact of a national livestock ID and traceability system? Um, I think you covered a little bit of that there, but maybe expand on, should it be managed private or by USDA or a combination of both? Um, so I, the kind of the research that we did and I didn't show all of this here was, you know, there is a, a strong um, pushback from anything that, um, is mandated and is managed by the government. That's not a knock on USC in any way, but there's a strong preference by our producers that say, you know, I really do not want traceability where it's 100% controlled and managed by the US government. Um, and some things that we're all very familiar with, right, is there's certainly liability concerns, there's confidentiality concerns, there's data security concerns, um, and all of those concerns are, are valid. And so what this research and what my, my personal research has showed and, and is looking at is saying, like, we want a nationally significant traceability system, but if we want that, we need to have higher participation. Um, you know, I'll use cattle trace as an example. It's an industry driven initiative where it's managed through a board of directors, right? That are producers in our industry. Um, and if a disease of Callan, you can correct me if I'm, if I'm misstating this, but my understanding is with cattle trace, right, is if something happened, that board of directors, cattle trace would work with our animal health officials to, to get the data that's needed for disease traceability, right? So this research is basically just showing that, that we can make big improvements in getting towards um, a system that's nationally significant in terms of higher participation by just taking that into consideration. Um, as far as mandates go, you know, there's the economics of that is it really touch and feel. It's a very contentious issue, so I don't want to get to dive too deep into it. But it's not clear to me that we have a situation where um, something like that is is needed, right? So any type of system that's mandated, it is a very uniform system. Um, but as we know in the cattle industry, we are a very, very, very diverse group of people. So, and, and no one knows the industry better than those that are in the industry. So why not partner with them and let them work through what a trace mode system should look like? And we can just say what we want to be able to do with it is quickly, effectively use it to control disease. So um, that's a long, long way of saying, uh, I think what was asked, but that's my, my general assessment of that. No, that's a great answer. Uh, we had a couple more questions come in here. I'm gonna combine two of them here. I think they make a lot of sense together. Uh, did the research distinguish RFID between low frequency versus high frequency or the potential read range of those tags with respect to the willingness to participate slash pay a premium? 
Yeah, so we'll get knocked for that. So we did not. Um, again, very, very important issue. Um, I don't want to get too deep into this. This is a geeky research type thing. But basically, if you make it a very, very specific example, that makes the, the research or the survey overly complex. And so it, it makes it harder to answer. Um, I, I certainly think that that's um, important. Um, my initial reaction is willingness to participate in low versus high is really just going to come down to cost, I would imagine. Um, so, yeah. That's what we've seen. Yeah, that's what I would. <laughs> economics wise, it says if something costs more, then we're not going to want to use it. Um, sure. So that doesn't mean it's not useful. It, you know, RFID high frequency is, um, you know, certainly an area that's, that's newer, but picking up. Um, so costs will work themselves out eventually. Perfect. Another question that came in, uh, another one from Andrew here, experience of foot and mouth disease outbreaks in the UK revealed from their side that a key benefit of traceability was the ability to lift movement restrictions earlier in low risk areas or low risk supply chains, similar to what you mentioned in your presentation there to get the markets working at least partially. Is that likely to be feasible in individual states or the USA as a whole? Um, so completely independent of this work that I've been affiliated with is, you know, we've got this, this plan in the U.S. called the Secure you know, Beef Supply Plan um, developed by lots of people that are way smarter than I am. But part of that plan is to ensure or, or outline a plan that producers could use such that, you know, if F&B happened, if you've got traceability, um, at least conceptually, right? So we haven't experienced that in such a long time. I, you know, wouldn't really actually know. But um, the idea is this plan, which would involve traceability, would ensure that, yeah, if you're in a um, FMD free zone, you could return to to you know business, right? Um, now there's probably some some USDA and some vet med epidemiologists that can do a much better job answering this than me. Now, what that FMD free zone looks like, I would imagine would very much depend on how quickly they can identify the, you know, the impacted region. But the idea is they could do a much quicker job of doing that if we had traceability. And it makes it much more feasible for operations that are FMD to return to business. So a great point there, James. I'll just add on to that. You know, I think there's a concerted effort uh, amongst the animal health officials on both the state and federal level. Um, like James mentioned, the push with secure beef supply, which the whole premise of secure beef supply is to keep your operational operation, uh, the ability to move quicker in the time of an outbreak uh, back to normal business. And like James said, I think that's a tool along with traceability being a tool to help resume those operations a little quicker. I think you'll continue to see more of a concerted effort amongst that group uh, as we move forward here. Hopefully, I think that'll be um, really key within that area. So uh, another question here that came in, to, does state-by-state -state adoption of traceability hinder the viability of a national program? Or in other words, can you speak to the minimum threshold of adoption that really makes traceability programs viable or you know, significant on that level? Um, so Callahan, you probably have the statistic on hand, but I, there's a difference between um, number of operations participating and number of cattle participating. Um, and my understanding is that the threshold that we need is based off of the number of cattle that are actually traceable, um, not the number of operations that are, that are in traceability, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, I don't know what the specific number is, but there is a number in mind that I'm, I'm sure people use to identify as yes, if we can trace X percent of the cow herd, then um, yeah, we've got nationally significant traceability. Now, does that, does that mean, you know, more of our bigger operations that are, that are in traceability? That's, you know, potentially more cows traceable. I don't know. So. No, that's a great point there, James. You know, I think one thing that we noticed as we went through, you know, a lot, we based a lot of uh, our early, uh, our early, uh, goals, I should say, off of uh, the World Perspectives report that was done in 2016. And it was a blanket number that said 67% of the industry would be uh, industry significant at that point. And then 
looking within that, like you mentioned, there was some great research done by some um, uh, by a team at Kansas State University that looked at that 67% and they found that the proportions of the number of cattle within each segment of the industry, you know, uh, cow-calf operations that are, you know, relatively larger or auction markets that, you know, move more cattle through those facilities and feed yards and so on and so forth. It became that percentage of number of cattle within the United States, but it still ended up being that total number of about 67, 68% there. Yeah. So if we could get to that 67 to 68% within the nation, um, they would consider that a nationally significant animal disease traceability system. Yeah, I'd, I'd say too, you know, the, the average cow herd is, is less than 50 head. Um, and so that tells me that from a operational operation standpoint, we would need a lot of cow-calf producers to adopt, but, you know, we've got fewer, but really, really large feedlots. So, you know, getting those feed, feedlots traceable gives us a large number of animals, but it's uh, a very sector by sector um, effort, like you discussed. One last one we have here, um, and if you guys have any other last questions, be sure to get those in the Q&A and chat box here. Um, this one kind of or bounces off one you've already answered earlier, um, but have you, ever, ever, have you ever investigated if the read range, those RFID tags, matters in some of the adoption? Um, so I think that's just a, you know, a benefit cost, basically, of a high frequency um, operation, right? So it's, it's going to cost more, but it also gives us the added benefit of, you know, it's an alleyway thing. You could breed more animals. So um, I would think that that's a good thing, right? That that's the benefit of the technology. That's why you would want it. The, of course, there's the cost side of that, which might keep it, you know, lower and in check with what low frequency um, participation is like. Um, but I, I think that high frequency is going to be, you know, I don't know how we get there or what it looks like, but it's going to be important for whatever traceability ends up looking like, right? So it's a really big thing for our auction markets, for example, right? So, you know, we've got some large, large auctions like Oklahoma City. We've got some smaller ones like Arkansas. You know, it doesn't seem feasible for some of those auctions to be able to manually one by one have to read those tags. So, you know, something like high frequency could really be a huge added benefit there for, for that type of example, right? So. Right. A example couple comments. Yeah, another couple comments that came into the chat box there, you know, was the emphasis between the two on the speed of commerce capabilities and how that fits into the industry today. I know, you know, the premise of US Cattle Trace right now is that, you know, if we can really work with the technologies and the speed of commerce for those operations, uh, I think we're going to see more overall success within animal disease traceability. And then another comment from an international perspective is that, um, you know, primarily when you look at those auction markets, like we talked about, uh, you know, they prefer the UHF uh, just because of the faster, longer read range um, and, and is becoming cheaper than the LF right there as well. So um, both important points there, I think. I think the unique piece of that um, from our perspective is the uh, increase in the technological capabilities of a disease traceability system and the abilities to fit into different sectors of the industry where you can continue your normal day-to-day -day operations, um, uh, you know, in the background while we're accomplishing disease traceability. So one last one here in the Q&A. Reading between the lines of the research, even though U.S. Cattle Trace is producer driven and managed, one we one would, excuse me, managed, one would assume we are still going to need incentives to drive adoption. Is that correct? That's exactly what we find, guys. Um, the, you know, the attributes of it, I guess you could say, so is it privately managed versus is it governmentally managed? That's a big driver, but there's still incentives that we need, right? So if it's purely disease traceability, um, the economics say, well, what really is the benefit to that? Um, some of them I talked about is, you know, um, secure beef supply. This is continuity. That's a huge incentive to do this. But for a lot of people, that incentive is, is really hard to attach a dollar amount in our head, right? Because, you know, I'm, in my lifetime and all of our lifetimes, we haven't seen FMD in the U.S. And I, 
you know, we all hope it stays that way. That's, that's the F word in my opinion, FMD. And, and so, you know, that's a very, very important benefit that would become much more obvious to us if the threat of FMD became even higher. Um, the, the, you know, crutch of, or the, the take home from the research was really, you know, are there ways where we could get premiums to our producers that are using these types of technologies? Um, you know, one example that was shared with me recently was, you know, if what if we just started having RFID technology with some of our preconditioned programs, what would that do? And, you know, that might be the next step that's needed that, you know, that takes this hypothetical research to a very real, you know, applicable way to realize that premium. So, oh, that keen eye from whoever made that comment. <laughs> Perfect. Last question here. If producers want to be able to access attribute information, how does that relate to their concerns about privacy of their information? I'll, I'll give a quick answer from U.S. Cattle Trace and then let you get after it there. Um, you know, from a U.S. Cattle Trace perspective, since we are solely focused on animal disease uh, traceability, uh, you know, that data is, is locked up and only to be accessed in case of a disease outbreak. And like James mentioned, you know, there's permissions even on, depending upon the disease uh, within our system, what we share with animal health officials along the way. And that's the dictated by our board of directors, which our members get to vote on the producers that represent them on that board. And so that would be how we do it from our side. But in terms of the technology that's used, the neat piece of it is we can be doing animal disease traceability over here and on this hand of the side, some of that attribute information that, uh, you know, could potentially be carried through a value add feeder calf marketing program or other sorts or aspects there. I think the neat part about that is that those could be uh, ran simultaneously with two different uh, outputs there in terms of the information. So uh, the technology is kind of an, a unique and interesting place, I think, to accomplish both of those goals. I'd add to that. So I like the, you know, certainly the privacy thing. That's a, that's something that I'll leave, you know, the cattle trace and other programs to work through because that's what they're working on. But I, I would say too, you know, to what we were talking about, about the attribute information versus trace of disease tracing information. Um, one thing I didn't really mention that has been talked about for a long time, but there's not always been a whole lot of follow through is that, you know, this information flow on the value add side doesn't have to go in one direction where cow calf producers are, are sharing information about their precondition programs with feedlots. Um, conceptually, that information could go in both directions where our cow calf operations could learn things about feedlot performance and, and carcass performance without having to necessarily retain ownership and, and do that exercise themselves. So that would that would be a huge benefit for a lot of people is, you know, having a direct way to share information on what this group of calves did when they got to the feed yard. So that's an example of information using traceability flowing both ways. Great point there, James. Guys, I appreciate everybody's there. If you have any other further questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at uscalatrace.org. Um, we'd be happy to pass those along to James. Um, James's contact information, we'd be happy to share that with all the participants here too. Um, after, if you have any further questions for him or myself, um, we'll send an email out with that. Just a reminder, this webinar was recorded and we will be posting that to our website and social media platforms here in the coming days. So if you guys want to access that again or share it with anybody else, we'd be more than happy to do that. James, I want to thank you again and appreciate your input here on the economics traceability. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, Kelly, and I enjoyed it. Thank you, guys.